started. Hello everyone, it's me, Maddie's Masquerade. You might remember me from such channels as the unbiased history of 4Kids Entertainment, Rumors Debunked, and the leading ladies of Mario, bosses, players, and former damsels. For this panel, I will be discussing the history of a gaming duo whose name you may either know from the good old days of the 90s, or may have recently heard of thanks to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, or the... Ooh. Or the Nintendo Switch Online. Oh, I forgot the microphone. Or the Nintendo... Uh -huh. Or the Nintendo Switch Online. I give you... Ban... Banjo-Kazooie. From green to Switch. In this panel, we will be covering the history of Banjo and Kazooie, starting from their roots as a Super NES game that never got past the planning stages to the recent re-release on the Nintendo Switch Online. We begin in 1995 with the gaming company Rareware. Nintendo owned a majority stake in Rareware. At the time, they were best known for some NES and Super NES games such as Battletoads and Donkey Kong Country. In 1995, Rareware and Nintendo had begun work on what was going to be a role-playing game for the Super NES, known as Dream Land of Giants. Ooh, hey. Uh, you know what, since you just came in here, uh, I'm going to start a... Uh, so, oh, what if we got some, some numbers and you know what? It's, it's only two minutes in. I'm gonna start over. <laughs> I don't know. I just keep going. All right. Okay. I'll just keep. I'll just keep going from here. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. It's good. Just like the one half hour left. Yep. Rare and Nintendo uh, begun work on what was going to be a role playing game for the Super NES, known as Dreamland of Giants. This game was going to star a boy named Edison and a dog named Dinger. Meanwhile, Banjo, the bear we all know and love, was originally intended to be a supporting character in Dream. The game was said to have a fairy tale style feel to it, mostly inspired by the Legend of Zelda games, early Japanese RPG games such as Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, as well as LucasArts point and click adventure games such as the Monkey Island series. The team wanted to combine these elements with the landscape and side scroller elements from Donkey Kong Country, but from a more isometric perspective. And the villain of the game was intended to be Captain Black Eye. Does he look familiar? His face was on some portraits in Mod Monster Mansion and Banjo-Kazooie, and he appeared as a tertiary character in Banjo-Tooie. But there was more to Captain Black Eye's dialogue in Banjo-Tooie than meets the eye. If you talk to him enough, he says, "Ah, I had a dream once. I were in this fine game. A bear stole me glory. Looked a bit like you, he did. The dream he is referring to is Dream, Land of Giants. And Banjo is the bear that stole his glory. The story I am telling explains how Banjo would eventually steal his glory. So, Dream had gone through multiple stages of development hell. A part of it involved the game becoming too big for a Super NES cartridge. So the only thing Rare could do was wait for Nintendo's next console. And in 1996, that console came in the form of the Nintendo 64. With the release of the N64, one of its launch titles, Super Mario 64, would set the stage for 3D collectathon platformers. Prior to the release of the Nintendo 64, when the team saw footage and builds for Super Mario 64, Rare and Nintendo had decided what was formerly Dream should now be a 3D platformer. The Rare team said that they considered doing what they were good at, platformers with animal protagonists, following in the footsteps of Donkey Kong Country. This is what ultimately caused, Ed caused Edison and Dinger to be scrapped, with Banjo being the primary character. One idea brought over from Dream was that Banjo would have robot wings or legs to come out of his backpack at times, to perform what eventually become the feathery flap and talon trot moves. Eventually, they decided to create an entirely new character, a fictional breed of bird known as a red-crested Breagull. That bird would originally be named Tweeter, and then Kazoo, and the game was going to be called Banjo-Kazoo, with no hyphen in the name. For copyright reasons, the name was eventually changed to Banjo-Kazooie. With the changes to the protagonist and setting in place, the team decided that the pirate theme would no longer fit the game. Therefore, in case of Captain Black Eye, this new adventure would feature a witch named Gruntilda as a villain, affectionately referred to as Grunty. With this in mind, Banjo would finally make his public debut on the Nintendo 64. In Diddy Kong Racing! Nope, Banjo-Kazooie hadn't been released yet. 
Banjo-Kazooie had originally been scheduled to be released shortly before the holiday season of 1997. Its release was delayed by a year, and Rareware needed a popular face to replace it. So who better than Diddy Kong, the co-star of Donkey Kong Country and the main star of Donkey Kong Country 2? Banjo first appeared as one of the playable racers in Diddy Kong Racing. He appeared alongside characters such as Diddy Kong, Tip Top the Turtle, who would later become a tertiary character in Banjo-Kazooie and Tooie, and Conquer the Squirrel. Conquer would eventually... I promised Poochie Kong this would be a family panel, so I won't go into that. With Banjo-Kazooie in the developer's minds, Kazooie is mentioned in the game's instruction manual, numerous fan series where that these two games took place in the same continuity. The most notable one is the website Donkey Kong's Jungle Vine, which tries to canon weld these games together. Where where developers Greg Mails and Chris Seaver have stated that Diddy Kong Racing and Banjo Kazooie are not intended to take place in the same universe. However, to quote Greg Mails, characters can travel between worlds to feature in each other's games. I guess this implies that there's no real strong continuity line, but characters can still be shared between universes, as Banjo and Tip Top would prove. Then on June 28, 1998, the Bear and Bird, Banjo and Kazooie, finally appeared in their own game as Banjo Kazooie had debuted on the Nintendo 64. The game was subject to critical acclaim and is responsible for much of the success of the Nintendo 64. It also helped 3D collectors on platformers take off, improving on the aspects that Super Mario 64 had already set. Now let's discuss the game's supporting cast. In this game, Grunty kidnaps Banjo's little sister, Tui, to try to steal her beauty upon learning that she is not the, Grunty is not the most beautiful creature in the land. The plot develops as Banjo and Kazooie adventure through nine different worlds in Gruntilda's Lair to rescue Tui. In the adventure, they meet friends to help them out. One of their allies is Bottles the Mole. He teaches Banjo and Kazooie all the moves that they need to get through Gruntilda's Lair and is often the subject of Kazooie's ridicule. Then there's Mumbo Jumbo the Shaman. He transforms Banjo and Kazooie into various animals so they can enter areas they could not in their normal state, such as a crawl space being too small. He was a former teacher of Gruntilda, but because he failed her, she turned his face into a skull. Then there's Grunty's younger sister, Brentilda. Despite their relation, she is not a fan of Grunty and snuck down to help Banjo and Kazooie teach her a lesson. She will gossip about Grunty's personal life to Banjo and Kazooie, which helps them pass Grunty's final test. And finally, Grunty's lost spellbook, Cheeto. He hides in Grunty's lair to give cheat codes to Banjo and Kazooie to help them on their quest. Two tertiary characters in this game will become secondary characters later on in Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. There's Captain Blubber, the hippo pirate who lost his gold, and Boggy the Polar Bear, who has eaten something he shouldn't and needs a sled racing partner. They're only around for a task or two in this game, at least. And who could forget Grunty's right-hand man, Klungo? Banjo and Kazooie don't actually meet him face-to-face -face in Banjo-Kazooie, but they'll see more of him later. Banjo and Kazooie will encounter numerous characters, good and bad. One notable one is Tip Top, whom you may remember from Diddy Kong Racing. He has a choir in this game. Gobi the Camel appears at various points, and Banjo and Kazooie must steal his water for various tests, much to his chagrin. And finally, the Mighty Ginginator. If you've played Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, you've seen him. He's in Banjo's Smash Attack. If you've been in any video game community in the late 90s and the early 2000s, chances are you've heard of at least one rumor that ended up not being true. This was the peak of it, with the internet taking off and fan checking not being something that was as prevalent as it is now. Collecting the Triforce in Ocarina of Time, L is Real 2041 in Super Mario 64, Mew being under a truck in Pokemon Red and Blue, Sonic and Tails in Super Smash Bros. Melee, and the list goes on. In Banjo-Kazooie, that mystery was Stop and Flop. Uh, are you guys here for Banjo-Kazooie for Dream to Switch? Yeah, I do. Yep, it's going on right now. Okay. All right, yep. Did you miss anything? 
Uh, okay, so to, to sum up what, what I just covered, I was just talking about the first game and Dream, everything that happened was Dreamland of Giants. I just went over all the char the main characters in Banjo-Kazooie, and now I'm going over Stop and Swap, and I was just talk talking about some nostalgic stuff from the late 90s and the early 2000s, uh, with all the bad rumors in video games, like the Triforce and Ocarina of Time, or Mew being under the truck in Pokemon Red and Blue. So, But in Banjo-Kazooie, that mystery was Stop and Swap. But unlike most of them, there was a glimmer of truth behind it. It all started at the end of Banjo-Kazooie, when Mumbo showed the protagonists and viewers three secret items that were inaccessible via normal gameplay means. He teased that they would be used in the upcoming sequel, Banjo-Tooie. This included a pink egg with question marks on it, found in Shark Food Island in Treasure Trove Cove, a giant ice key found in Waza's Cave in Freeze Easy Peak, and a blue question mark egg behind a locked door in Gobi's Valley. Immediately, rumors had started to spread about how to get them, with one accidentally being true. By entering in a levitation code, also known as Moon Jump, on a Game Shark device, players could bypass the ice wall and lost his cave and contain the ice key. The only thing that happened upon its collection was Kazooie saying, Cool, a giant ice key. We ought to save this for later and a new menu popped up in the start menu. That menu contained three words that gamers would obsess about over the next 10 years, stop and swap. Rumors were spreading about how this would be implemented, most of which were about if it could be used now or if gamers would have to wait until the release of Banjo-Tooie to use it. Before we continue, I'd also like to clarify one thing. It's rumored that the remaining eggs, the green, turquoise, red, and yellow eggs were first discovered by Subdragon Ice Mario, from the Rare Witch Project. They wouldn't come into play until later, but there was a Game Shark code that could unlock all of the eggs in key, which was how the others were discovered. The turquoise egg would be appear behind the formerly unbreakable barrel with the X on it in Mad Monster Mansion, while the green egg was on top of Lago the Toilet in the same world. The red and yellow eggs would appear on the captain's bed in Rusty Bucket Bay and on Nab Nut's table in Click Clock Wood in Winter, respectively. I don't know who discovered the code, but I remember seeing it on Joka64's FAQ on GameFAQs.com before Banjo-Tooie was ever released. And by the way, if you were on GameFAQs in those days, hi, I'm Donkey Kong Song! Remember that 500 kilobyte Banjo-Kazooie guide? It was written by yours truly! Before we continue discussing the theories, it's time I discuss what a 3D platformer is. Platform games have been around basically ever since video games have been. While they weren't the first, Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario 64 set the standards for 2D and 3D platform games, respectively. Side scrollers were the standard for platform games prior to the 3D era, and have been making a comeback ever since the release of new Super Mario Brothers for the Nintendo DS in 2006. But the late 90s and early 2000s were peak time for 3D platformers, and Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie were essentially the kings of that genre. This sparked numerous comparisons between the two titles, which I will go over in the next few slides. A defining item in 3D platformers is the abundance of items to collect. Banjo-Kazooie certainly had its fair share of those. Among the most notable items were puzzle pieces, also known as jiggies. There were ten of them in each world in Banjo-Kazooie, and the duo neat used them to open up new worlds by inserting them into incomplete pictures. This drew some comparisons to Super Mario 64, which had power stars in each world. However, collecting those power stars would open up the doors in Peach's castle that allowed Mario to travel to new parts of the castle rather than the levels themselves. In Super Mario 64, the levels were within pictures rather than ones you would complete to open up an entrance elsewhere. One other notable difference Banjo-Kazooie had in comparison with Super Mario 64 was that in the latter, when you collect the star, you automatically transport out of the level, and in some cases you must select a different mission to make one star available. In Banjo-Kazooie, that was not the case. You can stay in a world as long as you want, and collecting a Jiggy will not send you out. One other similarity between the two titles was that one of the main collectibles in each level was acquired when you collected several of a different collectible. In Banjo-Kazooie, that was these creatures known as Jinjos. Rescuing five of them would result in Banjo obtaining one of the world's ten Jiggies. In Super Mario 64, that was Red Coins. Collecting eight of them in one level would result in Mario obtaining one of that level's Power Stars. 
Despite Jiggy's not functioning the same way Stars did in regard to the game's hub world, Gruntilda's Lair and Banjo-Kazooie still had many sealed doors. They were known as note doors. There were a hundred notes in each world, and collecting them would open the note doors. However, these notes were probably what even the biggest fan of this game saw as its one fatal flaw. The notes did not stay collected. If the player were to leave the world or die, the number of notes they collected in that world would be considered their best note score, and they would have to recollect them all in order to raise their note score. Super Mario 64 had an abundance of coins in each level, with well over 100. In that game, collecting 100 coins would give the player a bonus power star, but the coins had no effect outside each level. Interestingly enough, the notes were more comparable to coins given how many there were in each world and the emphasis on collecting a hundred in each world. It seems notes functioned in Banjo-Kazooie the way stars did in Super Mario 64. The other items that could be collected in Banjo-Kazooie included Mumbo tokens, given to Mumbo Jumbo to pay for transformations, and extra honeycomb pieces. Collecting six extra honeycomb pieces would increase Banjo's energy bar by one segment. Banjo could also collect blue eggs for ammunition, red feathers to help Kazooie fly, and golden feathers for invincibility purposes. They would learn these moves and others from Bottle to Mole. All this and more made the game known for one element that it's still praised for today, exploration. Between Gruntilda's Lair and the Ninth World Within, Banjo-Kazooie received most of its praise for its emphasis on exploration. Then, on November 20th, 2000, Banjo-Tooie was finally released for Nintendo 64 after several production delays, the game was subject to similar critical acclaim. However, it wasn't without its detractors. The worlds were much bigger than the ones in Banjo-Kazooie, which some players liked and some didn't. Some felt the extra size added an extra challenge that was missing in Banjo-Kazooie, while others felt the game was getting more tedious. These discussions continue on discussion spaces to this date. Of note, Mumbo Jumbo was a secondary character in Banjo-Kazooie, but now he ascends to playable status. In each world, he has a different spell that he can cast. Two years ago, in Banjo-Kazooie, Grunty's fate was being crushed by a giant boulder that Klungo had tried endlessly to move, but to no avail. Help came in the form of Grunty's sisters, Mangella and Blabelda. They cast a spell to try to remove the boulder, but Grunty's flesh had deteriorated. So their plan to restore Grunty's body involved a giant gun known as the Vigo Blaster. It could suck the life force out of anything it pointed at. But before the witches left, Grunty's destroyed Banjo's house and killed Bottles in the process. It's up to Banjo and Kazooie to infiltrate Trake Grunty and her sister's new HQ and restore Bottles' life. As was the previous game, this game boasts a colorful cast of characters. Bottle's older brother, Sergeant Jamjars, has taken over the duty of his now late brother. He teaches Banjo and Kazooie some more moves which is his advanced training techniques that they will need to combat his more dangerous quest. Then there's Humbawamba, Mumbo Jumbo's rival and the self-proclaimed best shaman on the island. She takes over transformation duties in this game. Remember the Jiggies from Banjo-Kazooie? It seems they're connected to an ancient order, and Master Jiggy Wiggy is the leader of that sect. His goal is to find the one worthy of the Jiggies' possession. When Banjo and Kazooie gather the Jiggies, the challenge is them to a moving picture puzzle so they can prove their worth and for Jiggy Wiggy's Crystal Jiggy to open up new worlds for the duo to explore. Then there's Honey Bee, Mistress of the Honey. Banjo and Kazooie would turn in extra honeycomb pieces, or empty honeycomb pieces as they're called in this game, over to Hurt in exchange for an extended energy bar. And the last of the secondary newcomers, King Jingling. He is the king of the Jinjos from Jinjo Village. He enlists Banjo and Kazooie to help find his lost people, and is also the first of Grunty's sister's victims to get his life force stolen. Cheeto returns as well. Grunty tore out all his pages because he helped the duel with the last game. If they return the, his pages to him, he will give them a new secret cheat code to help them on their quest. And who could forget Grunty's right-hand man, Klungo? In this game, Banjo and Kazooie meet him face-to-face, -face, and he's not happy with what they did to Grunty in the last game. He seeks revenge for what happens, but between the beatings Banjo and Kazooie give him, as well as the ones Grunty does, he seems a little worse for wear. And now the tertiary characters. There's a lot of them to go over. And including a lot of returning faces from the last game, such as Tip Top, Gobi, and Kong of the Gorilla. 
Two of the notable ones are Mr. Fit and Jolly Roger. Mr. Fit is a self-proclaimed fitness champion, and Jolly Roger runs a pub and inn. Mm -hmm. Other teases for the game were done in Banjo-Kazooie, and those changes were seen in this game. For instance, when Gobi the Camel runs away, he says, Right, that's it. I'm off to the lava world. You'll never find me there. <laughs> Presumably, he was talking about a world that was scrapped from the original game known as Mount Fire Eyes, which was never implemented, likely due to hardware limitations or time constraints. This level was added to this game as the lava side of Hailfire Peaks. Also, in the previous game, Mumbo had mentioned he was going to turn Banjo into a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but ultimately decided to keep it for the next game. In Banjo 2, we transformation duties are passed on to Humble Wumpa, but Mumbo spell enlarged her wigwam so she could turn Banjo and Kazooie into the Daddy T Rex. So, what happened with the secret eggs and key? They appeared in Banjo-Tooie, but they were in blocking Banjo-Kazooie cartridges that you could smash open and find them inside. You could use the items in Banjo-Tooie to unlock bonus items. The eggs could be taken to Heggy the Hen. She would hatch the eggs to unlock the functions. The pink egg from Shark Food Island would unlock the Brie Gold Ash move, where Banjo and Kazooie would pull Kazooie out of his, where Banjo would pull Kazooie out of his backpack and literally bash her against the ground. If you've played Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, you may be familiar with this move. Huh? The blue egg from the sarcophagus in Gully's Valley would unlock a cheat code that could be entered into the code chamber in Mayahem Temple that would allow Banjo and Kazooie's eggs to home in on enemies. Huh? Unlike the other two eggs, the yellow egg from Nab Nut's house was already in Heggy's egg shed. Kazooie had to hatch the egg herself, and it would unlock the playable Jinjo in multiplayer mode. And lastly, the ice key was used to open a frozen safe to unlock the Mega Globo. The Mega Globo could then be given to Humble Wumpa so she could turn Kazooie into a dragon. So many players were confused as to what happened to Stop and Swamp, or if it would ever be implemented. Rareware did not let much information about Stop and Swamp out on purpose, not even to Nintendo. This is because they didn't want any information to reach the public until Banjo Tooie was released. But not informing Nintendo ended up being the downfall of the mechanic. The original plan involved the early N64 hardware, which would allow the console to store data from the last played game for about 10 or 60 seconds. Sources are varied and each say different things. After turning off the console, However, for prior to the release of Banjo-Tooie, newer copies of the N64 shortened that time to one second, making pulling this off next to impossible, and Stop and Swap was ultimately scrapped. So what did Banjo-Tooie do different from Banjo-Kazooie? A lot of the old collectibles returned, but with new twists. The duo started the game off with all the moves that they learned in the original, and they kept the blue eggs, red feathers, and gold feathers. Instead of laying about individually, all the items were grouped together in nests, making it easier to stock up on them. The biggest kind of nests there were were the note nests. Each nest had was worth five notes, but more importantly, the notes stayed collected even when Banjo and Kazooie left the world, which was a load off a lot of players' minds. There were also treble claps, worth 20 notes. Each world still had 100 notes, but they were much easier to collect here. In addition to the normal blue eggs, new egg types, alongside other new moves, could be learned from Bottle's older brother Jam Jars, including Fire, Grenade, Ice, and Clockwork Kazooie Bomb Eggs. The purpose of the notes in this game was to learn new moves from Jam Jars. He would teach Banjo and Kazooie new moves if they had collected enough notes. The Jiggies and Jinjos returned, but functioned differently. The Jiggies still opened up words, but instead of looking for pictures to fill up, Master Jiggy Wiggy would check Banjo's Jiggy tool before letting him complete a moving picture puzzle on screen, and if he won that, the world would open up. Rescuing Jinjos would still give the duel with Jiggy, but instead of the Jiggy counted as one for the hub world, ILO Hags. Unlike in the first game, where there was one of each color in each world, here there are families of similar colors spread throughout the game. To get the Jiggy, Banjo and Kazooie had to rescue all of one family, each Jinjo family lived in a color-coded house, the color corresponding to the color of the Jinjo. There were nine families in total. Another change from Banjo-Kazooie is how the shaman's magic works. As noted before, Mumbo Jumbo is now a playable character, so the transformation duties are left to another shaman, Humble Wamba. However, both shamans use Globos instead of Mumbo tokens to unlock their magic. At the end of Banjo-Tooie, Gruntilda says, 
You'll be sorry, all of you. Just you wait until Banjo 3, prompting many gamers, including me, to believe that a certain Banjo Kazooie game with that title was in development. Unbeknownst to us at the time, Banjo 3 was never in development and never intended to be released. Gruntilda's comment was simply there as a running gag, following her threatening to return in Banjo 2e at the end of Banjo Kazooie. Series developer Greg Mailed later mentioned on his Twitter that the next game the team had started working on after Banjo 2e was grabbed by the Ghoulies. He had said that the company was moving away from 3D platformers, including the transformation of 12 Tales Conquer 64 to Conquer's Bad Fur Day, and that no new Banjo games were in development at the time, but someone else took the blame for ruining Banjo 3. We'll discuss that later, but first let's go back to Stop and Flop. In 2001, the user Subdragon Ice Mario from the Rareware fan site The Rare Witch Project had discovered a list of cheat codes that could be used to enter on the sandcastle floor in Treasure Trove Cove in Banjo Kazooie. These cheats could unlock the eggs and ice key in Banjo Kazooie without the use of a cheating device. After this panel, I will post the codes on the Facebook events page. However, if you are playing on the Xbox Live Arcade, do not use these codes. Otherwise, your game's old saves will be disabled and you will lose your leaderboard status. This rumor may have started sometime from 1999 to 2001, I'm not sure when. The rumor was that Donkey Kong 64 was somehow involved in Stop and Flop. It started from some pre-release photos of Banjo-Kazooie that had a picture of Donkey Kong in Banjo's house, where 2D was in the final game. Also in the final game, when players attempt to start Bottles puzzles by looking at the picture of Bottles in Banjo's house, Kazooie will call him Barrel Boy, even though Bottles has nothing to do with barrels, but barrels are one of Donkey Kong's signature items. Furthermore, in pre-release photos of Donkey Kong 64, an image of Banjo and Kazooie are in Donkey Kong's shower. This rumor turned out to be true. Players who dove deep into Donkey Kong 64's data found the word Ice Key in the View Totals menu. According to the developer, Stop and Flop was originally intended to connect it to be connected other rare games on the Nintendo 64 before it was scrapped. Then, on September 24, 2002, Microsoft Studios had purchased Rareware. Players blamed Microsoft for the cancellation of Banjo 3, knowing if not knowing it was never in production in the first place. The reason Microsoft bought Rare is because the cost to develop video games had been on the rise. In order for the business to be profitable, Rare asked Nintendo to purchase them completely. However, Nintendo refused, saying that they didn't need them going forward. It's unknown what that meant, but the popular rumor is that Nintendo was moving away from third-party games. They may have wanted to focus more on their first-party properties going forward. However, since Microsoft did not have a competing handheld console, some of the Game Boy Advance games that Rareware had been working on could still be released. One of those games was Banjo-Kazooie Grunny's Revenge, released September 12, 2003. This was an interquel between Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, taking place after the former but before the latter. In this game, when Klungo was still trying to move the rock, Grunty's ghost came out of the rock, so Klungo built a robot body for her known as Mecha Grunty. Mecha Grunty kidnapped Kazooie and traveled back in time to prevent Banjo from ever defeating her. Mumbo sent Banjo back in time to rescue Kazooie and defeat Mecha Grunty. As with the previous game, this game boasts a colorful cast of characters. In this game, the move learning duties are passed on to Bazai, an ancestor of bottles and jam jars. The last of the new secondary characters is the Jinjo Oracle. She gives hints to Banjo and Kazooie as they rescue the Jinjos, as well as rewarding them for Jiggies for doing so. Younger versions of Jiggy Wiggy, Mumbo, and Honey Bee are present in this game. Respectively, they still have the roles of opening levels, transformations, and energy bar extensions. One game, Diddy Kong Pilot, was canceled mid-development because when Microsoft bought Rare, Nintendo can reclaim full rights to Diddy Kong and the other Kong characters that Rareware had created for the Donkey Kong Country trilogy and Donkey Kong 64. This led to Diddy Kong Pilot eventually becoming Banjo Pilot, a handheld airplane racer for the Game Boy Advance released on January 12th, 2005. In this game, Banjo, Kazooie, Mumbo the Jinjo, Humble Wumba, Grunty, Klungo, Bottles, and Jolly are selectable racers. 
As the years went by, one thing was on many a player's mind, stop and swap. People were so determined to search the ends of the earth until they discovered what it was really supposed to be. Players were so obsessed that any glimmer of hope was enough for them to keep searching. One common idea was that if the eggs and key were in Banjo-Kazooie, they had to do something in that game. This was mocked in other rare games. One example is in Grabbed by the Ghoulies, where a picture of the eggs and key are on a whiteboard in the classroom with the homework assignment being, one, collect ice key, two, collect eggs, three, activate secret level. Also in Banjo Pilot, Cheeto will offer the player stop and swap in exchange for some Cheeto pages. But when you give them to him, he answers with, why don't you stop annoying me and swap this game for a nice book or something? So there, so was there going to be any more to Banjo-Kazooie besides these Game Boy Advance leftovers? It seems so. On September 22nd, 27, 2006, when Microsoft revealed the trailer at E306 that claimed that Banjo is back. The trailer seemed to be te teasing a certain mainline Banjo game with collectibles, just like the series' loyal fan base has grown to expect from this franchise. Eventually, in 2008, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts was released for the Xbox 360, a full 10 years after the first game's release on the Nintendo 64. Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts departed from the usual collect us platform game that the first two titles had set the stage for, instead focusing more on vehicle building. The new change was accepted by some and reviled by others. More recently, reception for the game has been more positive, especially by those who feel the vehicle building element is what sets the stage for later games, such as Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, and even Minecraft. In this game, eight years had passed since Banjo and Kazooie's latest adventure in Banjo Tooie. The duos put on a little weight, while Grunty, determined to get her revenge, hopped to Spiral Mountain despite being a decapitated skull. As the two prepare to fight, if you can even call it that, uh, the Lord of Games interrupts them and challenges the two of them to a vehicle building contest. Whoever can build the best vehicle while still collecting jiggies will get control of Banjo's home area, Spiral Mountain. In this game, several old characters return from Banjo Kazooie and Tubi with new introductions. One major difference is that in each world they serve a different purchase and purpose and act as if they were playing a different role. Though in the hub world of Showdown Town, they have a main purpose. Huh? Among the newcomers, we have Officer Picklet, the chief of police of Showdown Town. If Banjo and Kazooie are caught breaking the law, such as accidentally insulting him or freeing his prisoner Jinjo while he's on duty, he'll try to arrest them, but he's more of a nuisance than an actual threat. Trophy Thomas is one character who retains his personality regardless of area. He's always looking to race Banjo and Kazooie, as his name implies, defeating his Nemna to do a trophy. Since Klungo deserted her in Banjo Tui, Grunty has a new right hand sidekick in Piddles the Cat. The two of them don't get along at first, but they eventually learn to work together. Now for our returning characters. How's Klungo doing anyway? He promised at the end of Banjo Tui that he was going to go into game design, and he made good on that promise. He lets Banjo and Kazooie play his game, Hero Klungo Saves the World, in exchange for musical notes. Huh? Mumbo's back too. He's given up on magic and now he owns Mumbo's Motors, where Banjo and Kazooie can design new vehicles with the parts and crates that they find. Humba Wumba doesn't appear to be too interested in magic anymore either. Instead, she sells Banjo and Kazooie vehicle parts and blueprints in exchange for musical notes. Huh? King Jingling runs a business in Showdown Town 2. It's Jinjo Bingo. Winning in his games will award the duo with more musical notes and vehicle parts. Huh? Finally, Bottles has become a tour guide in Showdown Town, giving Banjo and Kazooie hints on what to do next. But that's not all of the recurring cast. Huh? Some of the tertiary characters in Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie have descended to secondary status. Foggy runs a gym now. He lets Banjo and Kazooie upgrade their stamina, speed, and other stats. Jolly Roger. Oops, he changed his name to Jolly Dodger in this game. He seems to have abandoned the honest business of an inn and pub and has gone to selling jiggies on the black market. Huh? Both Captain Blubber and Mr. Fit sell trapdoor towers to Banjo and Kazooie. These towers usually contain Mumbo crates, which have vehicles inside. Banjo Kazooie and Banjo Tooie were remastered and ported to the Xbox Live Arcade, 
shortly after the release of Nuts and Bolts. The Xbox Live Arcade versions of Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie were essentially re-releases of the first two Nintendo 64 games, but there were some differences. For one, the draw distance of faraway items and NPCs was vastly improved, given the more advanced hardware of the Xbox 360. In addition, most Nintendo references were removed and replaced with Microsoft references. During the end credit sequence for Banjo-Kazooie when Mumbo would reveal the pictures, the reference to Banjo-Tooie was replaced with references to nuts and bolts. In addition, due to the new technology, Stop and Swap could finally be implemented. All three games would, could be connected via the Xbox 360 operating system software, something that didn't exist on the N64 console. To unlock Stop and Swap, you must own Banjo-Kazooie for Xbox Live Arcade and either Banjo-Tooie or Nuts and Bolts. The items will be will be open to collect in Banjo-Kazooie if you have Banjo-Tooie or Nuts and Bolts, and can be ported to those games easily. In Banjo-Tooie, the pink, blue, and yellow eggs and Ice Key do the exact same thing they did on the N64, with the remaining three eggs now unlocking decorations for your Xbox 360 profile. In Nuts and Bolts, they unlock new vehicle parts. So what about the walking Banjo-Kazooie cartridges? They are still present in the Xbox Live Arcade port of Banjo-Tooie, and inside was the gold, silver, and bronze eggs. Delivering these eggs to Heggy would unlock a new gamer pick, a new scene for your Xbox 360 profile, and Stop and Swap 2. As of today, there appears to be no use for the Stop and Swap 2, and a function was likely added as a joke. Animator Emilio Lopez leaked some concept art for a Banjo-Kazooie animated series that he had been working on around the time of Nuts and Bolts' release. It seems that this series was meant to tie into the release of Nuts and Bolts. It would have either aired on Cartoon Network or possibly even Fox's Saturday Morning Block, alongside another program based on a rare game, Viva Piñata. However, it never came to fruition. Between Microsoft's acquisition of Rareware and the release of Nuts and Bolts, it seems Rare was working on several other unreleased Banjo-Kazooie titles. One of them was Banjo-X, which was said to be a remake of the original Banjo-Kazooie. So far, only a few character models have been released from that game, including Ticker, the termite enemy, and Kong the gorilla. Banjo-Kazooie was also in production, which was a racing game that was going to feature some of the vehicles from Nuts and Bolts. But both titles were scrapped. It seems the former was scrapped in favor of the Xbox Live Arcade port of Banjo-Kazooie, and the latter due to Rare mostly focusing on Kinect games following the release of Nuts and Bolts. However, Banjo and Kazooie would get one more appearance in the Xbox 360 version of Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing. This was a cross-platform game released for the Wii, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360, and each version of the game had a unique character exclusive to that console. On the Xbox 360, Banjo and Kazooie took that slot and the game was titled Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing with Banjo-Kazooie. Some of the scrap vehicles from Banjo-Kazooie were used in this game. <clears throat> but after that racing appearance, many years had passed and our beloved Baron Bird had seemed dormant. It felt like they would never see the light of day again. Outside of Rare Replay, a compilation of 30 different Rare games released on the Xbox One, it included Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, as well as the Xbox Live Arcade versions of Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. But aside from that, it seemed like we'd never see Banjo or Kazooie again. Until June 11th, 2019, at E3 that year, a new trailer for the DLC characters for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate was re-released, and the characters were none other than Banjo and Kazooie. This was the first time the duo had ever been on a Nintendo console since Banjo Highlight over 14 years ago, and the first time they've been on a home Nintendo console since Banjo-Tooie, which was a 19-year gap. It seems that Banjo, Bayonetta, and Sora had been in the top three most requested characters before the fourth Super Smash Bros. title was released. It appears that developer Masahiro Sakurai had wanted Banjo and Kazooie to be a part of the franchise's earliest Super Smash Bros. Melee, at least as trophies. But being a company located in England, and the technology for remote meetings wasn't exactly top of the line back then, it was difficult to set up due to time zones. 
On September 4th, 2019, Banjo and Kazooie were officially added to the Super Smash Brothers Ultimate roster as DLC characters, as part of as well as part of Fighters Pack 1 and a standalone purchase. They also come with several remix music tracks from Banjo Kazooie and Banjo Tooie, and their home world Spiral Mountain was added as a stage. With renewed interest in the franchise following the duo's addition to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, series composer Grant Kirkhope released a soundtrack album on most of, uh, of most of the music from the original Banjo Kazooie on music platforms and as a vinyl CD. It was called Banjo Kazooie Rejiggied, and most of the music was redone in a more modern and contemporary style. Over two years later, the N64 version of Banjo Kazooie was added to Nintendo's cloud service for older titles the Nintendo Switch Online Expansion Pack. That about wraps up the history of Banjo-Kazooie. I will be opening the floor to questions, but there are two questions you likely have that I will answer now. No, I do not think any new Banjo-Kazooie games are in development right now. In the unlikely event that there is one, it will not go back to the franchise's traditional platforming origins. As I mentioned early on, Greg Mails was planning to move away from 3D platformers ever since Conker's Bad Fur Day was released. In addition, most of the team that had worked on the platform or games at, had left Rare after Nuts and Bolts. In the first area for that game, Lord of Games made an anti-platformer comment, and that team had left to form their own independent company, Playtonic Games. This explains the birth of Ukulele, the so-called spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie. It was applied in that game's parody of the DK rap from Donkey Kong 64 with the birth they said the scene's dead, and that's, but that's a load of yap, but we're here to prove it with this familiar rap. And now I open the floor to any questions. Uh, I only see four of you there, and I don't see anybody raising their hand, so uh, thanks for coming. I'm glad I could attend the panel. Yeah, and uh, I, I did this one before at MAGFest, but since a lot of you came late, I will, I'll be uploading it to my YouTube channel, and I'll be posting my business card in the Facebook events page and on PoochieCon's Discord. Um, you can also come up and get a physical business card from me, but with that, I turn off the recording now.